and also our online participants. Thank you for honoring the invitations from the Vice Chancellor, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic Affairs, and the Chairperson of the Professorial Inaugural Lectures Committee. May I request Professor John H. Muyonga to stand up? Maybe we don't know him. Uh -huh. Yes, congratulations in advance. That's why we are here. So today, that is our Mugole in the academic world. May I, it's not my duty to in, welcome you here. There is a person who is going to officially welcome you, and that is the chairperson of the Professorial Inaugural Lectures Organizing Committee, PILO. Professor David Bachwinga, most welcome. Uh, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe. Uh, we have here also the two deputy vice chancellors, uh, Professor Omar Kakumba and uh, the DVCA, <laughs> members of council present, members of uh, central university management, professors and academic staff, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Professorial Inaugural Lectures Organizing Committee, sometimes known as PILOC, I welcome you to the inaugural professorial lecture to be delivered by Professor John Muyonga, <coughs> Professor of Food Science based at the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. I congratulate Professor Muyonga on gathering the courage to deliver the lecture given the infrequency of uh, such lectures here at Makerere. About five to seven such lectures have been delivered over the last seven years. We intend to improve on this by organizing at least three inaugural lectures annually. Um, I'm happy to note that Professor Mionga is delivering his lecture exactly 21 years after I delivered mine in 2002. <laughs> I take this opportunity to appeal to professors to prepare their inaugural lectures as soon as they are promoted to the rank of professor. Uh, PILOC is available to guide those who are ready. I have with me here some of my colleagues uh, members of the PILOC committee, Professor Edward Bale, uh, he's over there. <laughs> Professor uh, D uh, Dominic DePio, who uh, led us in prayer, is also here. <laughs> the committee also consists of Professor Harriet Mayanja Kiza from the College of Health Science. Professor Anthony 
Oyana, I don't know whether he has come. He's, oh, he's here. <laughs> From uh, coaches and uh, Professor Mukadas Boyinza, academic registrar, who normally provides support to uh, the committee. I'm also grateful on this occasion to the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Affairs, and the offices of the Academic Registrar and Public Relations for the support given in organizing and publicizing this lecture. I thank you all for coming. I'm sure you'll enjoy uh, the professorial lecture. Uh, since all of us have to eat food, I'm sure you'll be interested in what Professor Mayonga has to say about food. So I thank you for coming as we build for the future. Thank you. Professor David Bachivenga is from the School of Law and he's as brief as that. So you're welcome. May I humbly invite the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic Affairs, if you remember all the invitations originated from the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic Affairs this time to do a simple task with respect to protocol to invite the Vice Chancellor of Makere University to deliver his welcome remarks. Thank you. Uh, many thanks to you, Arita, and a very good afternoon to all the participants in, in this. Uh, it's a simple task for me to invite the Vice Chancellor, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe, to welcome the gathering and also our guest of honor today, the Professor John Moyonga, VC Commander Dresden. Recording in class. Members of Council present, members of Senate, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Affairs, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Finance and Administration, members of Management, the Chairperson and members of the Professor Inaugural Lecture Organizing Committee, Professor John Muyonga, our Mugole, and your members of your family, members of staff, our alumni and students distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I take this opportunity first to congratulate Professor Muyonga on making all necessary preparation to deliver his professor inaugural lecture today. This is the way to go as we continue to boost our scholarship, image and reputation. Promotion to full professor at McKay University follows a very rigorous process in which an applicant's research, teaching, and service are thoroughly evaluated by peers who assess the quality and the impacts of their contributions at the local, national, and international levels. Inaugural professorial lectures bring together faculty and students along with interested members of the community. They showcase, they are a showcase of events that demonstrate Makerere University's research and teaching capabilities. An inaugural lecture is an occasion of significance in an academic staff member's career at the university. It provides our professors with the opportunity to share their achievements in research, innovation, engagement, and teaching activities before an audience of members of the university community and the general public. Our inaugural lectures provide our professors with the opportunity to share their achievements and also showcase their, their, the, the, the difference their research, innovation, engagement, and teaching is making to society. The professorial lect inaugural lecture should act as an inspiration to all of us as scholars to not only learn but also continuously disseminate our work. 
I want to implore other colleagues at the rank of professor in the university to emulate Professor Muyonga and also deliver their professorial lectures. I commend the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences for spearheading the initiative leading to Professor Muyonga's presentation and I applaud the Professorial Inaugural Lectures Organizing Committee led by Professor Vakivinga for a job well done in pre preparing this event. All professors upon promotion to the rank become candidates for delivering their professorial inaugural lectures. Makel University is in the process of making the professorial inaugural lectures mandatory and the Office of the DVC Academic Affairs is working on a proposal which will be presented to Senate for approval. I therefore encourage all our professors to, in addition to their great work, make the necessary preparations to deliver their inaugural lectures. We took a deliberate decision in the strategic plan 2020-2030 to be a research-led university, where research is the cornerstone informing other activities including teaching and innovations. We have presented our case to government to declare Makerere a research university and are hopeful that this will be accepted. Makerere University already produces a great percentage of the total research output in Uganda. The correlation between investment in research and national development is already well established. We have steadily been improving our systems and processes to create an enabling environment for improved research, which ultimately should produce more professors. We have the highest number of academic staff holding PhD qualifications, and we now attract more research funds. The available funding is also an opportunity to double our annual PhD graduation output targeted at 200. That is, we are at the moment producing 100, but we want initially to double. But really, a universe of our stature should be producing even more than 200. Undoubtedly, it is our role as professors at McKay University to provide scholarly leadership and mentorship to enable the institution reach these strategic goals and aspirations. I appointed a committee led by Professor Roda Wanyenze, which is among others, scrutinizing the research landscape with the attendant issues, which are constraining the optimal realization of our research agenda and targets. The committee is expected to make practical recommendations, which will further enable us unlock the existing potential, leading to our improved contribution to the socio-economic transformation of our country. Regarding the infrastructure, I am pleased to inform you that Tororo Cement has also offered to construct a new building that will house the Directorate of Research and Graduate Training with decent facilities for faculty and students to execute, to execute research activities at Mackay University. <laughs> this is the first time that a local philanthropist has offered to invest in improving research and education facilities at Mackay University, and we thank them very much. Professor Muyonga's topic for his inaugural lecture, Circular Bioeconomy, Applications to the Agri-Food Sector, is quite novel and contemporary, testifying that Mackay University possesses the competencies and capacities to substantially address the national and global development challenges. Our science, creation of new knowledge and innovations in this field will be crucial for national stability, cognizance of Uganda's rapid population growth, and high levels of youth unemployment. As a premier university, we should harness the emerging opportunities, including artificial intelligence, which appears to be a game changer to find practical solutions to complex societal challenges at multiple scales. I, just like you, look forward to be further inspired by Professor Muyongo's professorial inaugural lecture as we build for the future. Thank you for your attention.
Yes, thank you very much, Vice Chancellor, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe. What the Vice Chancellor missed out was that when you deliver a professorial inaugural lecture, so many opportunities come your way, and we have a living example. Um, previously, we had uh, Professor Edward Bali. I'm going to request him to stand up. If you remember, <laughs> Professor Edward Bale delivered his uh, professorial inaugural lecture. And just after some months, he was appointed on merit, yes, as the director of research and graduate training. Right? Yes, so we are also here today to witness John H. Muyonga, Professor of Food Science, and we are looking forward. Right. <laughs> yes, may I humbly request in a minute the principals in the room to stand. I know some are online, but I'm requesting those physically present here in use of Lule Central Teaching Facility Auditorium, the principals to stand up. Yes, um, oh, okay, let me mention, kindly remain standing. Yes, we have um, Professor Josephine Ahikide, the Principal College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Kindly remain standing. We have Professor Frank Amune, Principal College of Veterinary Medicine, Animal Resources and Biosecurity. Professor Tony Oyana, Principal, College of Computing and Information Sciences. Okay. We also have the Deputy Principal, Dr. Eric Awich, from College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Please remain standing. We also have the Deputy Principal from the College of Natural Sciences. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much for the acting principal, College of Natural Sciences. We also have the acting principal, College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, Dr. Yazid Bamutase. And also, now I don't know, but I want to imagine his deputy principal, College of Education and External Studies. Dr. Ronald Visa. So I'm, I've requested you to stand up so that the people in this room and the online participants are able to know that we would like to have, in line with the Vice Chancellor's speech. Oh. Oh. Yes. And um, Dr. Venina Kazibwe. Acting Principal, College of Engineering, Design, Art and Technology, but substantively she's the Deputy Principal, College of Engineering, Design, Art and Technology. Now these are our leaders and we are honored that they are present. Previously we had Professor Edward Bale from the College of Business and Management Sciences delivering his inaugural lecture. Today we are honored to have Kayes. And the Vice Chancellor in his speech, he said he wishes that we could come here monthly so that we have professors delivering professorial inaugural lectures. So these are our leaders, and we know that in every college there is a professor. Thank you so much for listening to the Vice Chancellor's speech. Take your seats. <laughs> May I now invite the principal, College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, Dr. Yazid Bamtaze, to ably introduce Professor John H. Muyonga to us. Now, I want to imagine, especially the family members, they are like, hey, but we believe we know Daddy more. Yes? But then there is a person 
who understands Professor John H. Muyonga in the academic world. So he's going to speak to us since this is the professorial inaugural lecture by John H. Muyonga. And to your family members, if you feel there is something that is said and you do not know about maybe daddy, just know that that is who he is. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Rita, for the nice introduction. You have given me two titles, actually three. One is principal, the other acting principal, and the other deputy principal. I take all the titles at this particular moment. I know when I finish speaking, the rightful title will apply. But I also wanted to observe Rita that uh, my principal, Professor Goret Nabanoga, promised to be online if you are tracking those who are available online at the appropriate moment you may wish to recognize her fully in her capacity. Uh, members of council present here, I can see some seated. The Vice Chancellor, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe, members of Makerere University Senate, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Affairs, Professor Umar Kakumba, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Finance and Administration, Professor Henry Alinaitwe, the Acting Academic Registrar, members of Makerere University Management present, college principals already introduced earlier, the Chairperson of PIROC, Professor David Bachvinga, our main guests, a professor John Muyonga together with your family, members of staff, invited guests, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. As College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences, we are extremely gratified by your presence today and we thank you for dedicating time to come and honor our own Professor John Munyonga deliver his inaugural lecture. I have no doubt personally that his talk today will inspire many of us regardless of our positions. I take great honor and pleasure in the opportunity given to me personally to introduce or give citations as we call it in academics about uh, the academic giant of the caliber of Professor Muyonga, while also recognizing the daunting task at my disposal, essentially to abstract him in just 10 minutes. So I will start with the basic fact that have already been uh, given earlier on. We all know in this room that he is a professor and he is a professor of food science, and he has occupied that rank for about uh, 13 years. You may also not know, but it's good to know now, that he's one of the 19 professors in the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. As a college, we also take pride that he's one among the 23 percent of all the professors serving in Makerere University. We occupy, I think, the first position. But what has been his journey that has gotten us uh, here today? In his foundation and formative stages, Professor Munyonga started his education at Wukedea Demonstration School. He apparently attended many primary schools, including Wuvulo Mixed Primary School, Navumari Boarding Primary School, Nabongo Boarding Primary School. When he completed that, he attended his secondary education, first of all at Navumari High School, 
and later joined Makerere College School, which is very close to us here. As it was at that time, he joined Makerere University to pursue a BSc in Food Science and Technology, which he completed in 1994, obtaining the highest CGPA from the then Faculty of Agriculture and Forestry. Needless, <laughs> needless to say, colleagues present here today, that at that particular time, there was barely no internet in Uganda, there was no Google, and most importantly, there was no chat GPT to aid students. So his competencies and qualities can be traced in his DNA. He later joined Cornell University in the US, graduating with an MSc in food science in 1996. And after that, he continued his studies, pursuing a PhD, which he did in South Africa at University of Pretoria, completing it in 2003. His academic career started in 1997 when he joined Makerere University, appointed a lecturer in 1997. In 2002, he was promoted to senior lecturer. In 2006, he was promoted to associate professor. And in 2010, he was promoted to full professor. And it's for that reason, obviously, why we are here Day. He earned his professorship at a tender age, and it took him a period of just seven years after completing his PhD in 2003 and becoming a full professor at Makerere University in 2010. I have to state uh, factually that he never skipped in a rank, so his progress or his journey was very progressive. Professor Muyanga has been steadfast in conducting impactful scholarship and research, and we all know that he stands tall locally in his entity, nationally in Uganda, regionally in East Africa, continentally, as you know, and internationally, as we all know. He is a strong scholar with a stellar record of academic uh, outputs, and his uh, publication portfolio stands at over 80 peer-reviewed journal articles published in his 26 years of service to Makerere University. When you do a simple calculation by Chancellor that translates to about uh, three journal articles per year, which is six times higher than the modest institutional requirement. Apparently, when you read the policy document of Makerere, we are merely required to produce at least 0 0.5 publications <laughs> per year per academic staff. But there, I'm talking about journal publications. In addition, he has produced six book chapters, two edited books, and he has two registered utility models. By all metrics, Professor Muyonga's publications have been impactful to the scientific community. We commonly check our profiles by easily going to the Google Scholar. You can check your Google profile. And when you check that, you realize that Professor Myunga has approximately 4,000 citations. For those of us who are in the academic field, please check and compare. And you may realize that your record may be dismal compared to what Professor Myunga has. But most importantly, we also have those indices. If you check uh, his H index, it stands at 26. 
but more importantly, his I-10 index stands at 46. So those journal articles that have at least been cited over 10 times. <laughs> Professor Myonga's research is concentrated largely in the areas of nutraceutical and physical chemical properties of traditional Ugandan foods, improvement of traditional food handling and processing methods, extrusion technology, novel drying techniques, as well as agri-food waste valorization. So you may already pick that in looking at that, it's not only the science we do at the universities, it also tallies and relates with what society and government especially is looking for. Because of his uh, sound scientific, academic, and scholarly records, many international journals have been soliciting for his services, and currently he's serving as associate editor of two international journals. One of them is the Journal of Food Bioscience, which currently has an impact factor of 5.3, but most importantly, it's published by the reputable Elsevier family, which we are always desiring to at least have our publications there. He's also an associate editor for the African Journal of Foods, Agriculture, Nutrition, and Development. He has peer-reviewed dozens of manuscripts from a compendium of journals helping in the elevation of science, especially in the field of uh, food science. He has served with distinction as external examiner for many universities in Germany, Australia, South Africa, Kenya, Rwanda. I can't have the time really to complete uh, the list. He has a passion for teaching. It's not only doing the teaching, but his teaching is anchored in certain philosophies. He has been very kind, supportive, and compassionate to students. Professor Myonga has supervised a total of 33 graduate students to completion, which includes at least nine PhD students. I do not have the time to count the undergraduate students he has supervised. I may repeat myself that he has served for a period of about 26 years. Out of 26, he dedicated 14 of those years to serve Makerere in leadership and management positions continuously from 2006 to 2019. Firstly, he headed the Department of Food Science and Technology from 2006 to 2011. And then secondly, he pioneered as the Dean of the School of Food Technology, Nutrition, and Bioengineering. It's important to note that he peacefully handed over the mantle of deanship to his successor, but that successor came from a pool of people he had mentored in leadership. So there was no vacuum when he left, and he's happy to be in the background to see others steer the school effectively. His leadership was innovative and transformational in nature, developed four new programs for the school at the time, he improved research infrastructure, increased enrollment of graduate students, increased the overall publication outputs of faculty and students in the school, and he committed time and invested himself in making sure that there is a commercialization of various new food products in the school. He has been very key in developing the research capacity of previously unresearched uh, foods, including grain amara and consumption. And when I talk about the peels and other materials we, we separate from food, 
uh, these materials contain nutrients because the body doesn't really mind where the nutrients are coming from. It requires vitamins, it requires protein. So these materials we are throwing away contain those nutrients. But these materials we are throwing away also contain uh, compounds that are good for our health. They are called nutraceuticals. They help us to stay healthy. So we are throwing away those valuable products and causing pollution in the environment. We are causing pollution by throwing them away, but we are also contributing to pollution because production of this food generates greenhouse gases. So that is one side of the dilemma. You have food, we're throwing it away, and it's polluting the environment. And on the other side, people are hungry. It is estimated that about 10% of the world population go to bed hungry. 811 million. We also know that in developing countries, about 45% of deaths among children is because they don't have good nutrition. And on the other side, the professors have thrown away the food. Uh, lastly, increasingly, we are having uh, these diseases they call non-communicable diseases, hypertension, diabetes, and those kinds which takes me to the second aspect of my presentation. I said that while the word bioeconomy is widely used, I wouldn't want to that it's understood. So I'll write a few concepts about the house, no. The traditionally thinking about extract, take use to make products. Once you've made the products, throw away. So if you make a vehicle and it's all because of sustainability concerns, we are cycle economies uh, capture the value in the materials after their life and use them. Alternatively, economies are also preventing materials from getting lost in the first place. So if you give waste new that is part of circular economy. And uh, as I said before, apart from waiting for the waste to think about recycling or reuse, we also try to uh, minimize waste in the first place. So circular economy is uh, a concept that has become very globally uh, of global interest. But what is circular bioeconomy? Circular bioeconomy the concepts to biology and we use so in this cycle uh, if you minimize waste products then that is the economy so part of what we look for in bioeconomy is to reuse as much as possible products from a given harvest. Instead of throwing away the mango, we want to try to find something to do with the mango and generate value of it. So I hope that much of the title for today's talk has been clarified to some extent. Uh, but as we get into the third part of this talk, uh, one of the other components that I thought needed a little bit of justification is a food sector. I'm a food scientist, and uh, maybe people would have said, why not would be interested in utilizing throw that away. It's not agri-food waste. And uh, it would be important to understand where is this waste coming from? Because if you are going to try to prevent it, which is one of the objectives, you've got to understand where it's coming from. Uh, the waste comes from the parts we separate off. I gave the example of mango. You intentionally separate it off. When you're harvesting food, you may intentionally uh, leave some of the uh, parts in the garden 
that is waste. In processing, we intentionally remove some parts, and that generates waste. It generates agri-food waste. The other source of waste is spoiling along the value chain. You've got the food, you've not so by the end, it's not acceptable to consumers, so that also becomes waste. Then there is the third category, where because of excess, people would have enough food served on the, too much food served on it, and they will end up. In some countries, you go to the and uh, when you're applying your potatoes, they'll say, this size is not good, so that's up in the dumping, in the, in, in the landfill. So these are the main sources of waste that we are looking at. And uh, if we are to dichotomize our foods, we normally think about food origin and food origin. And oftentimes you hear that eat more vegetables, eat more fruits. This is because apart from the nutrients, these vegetables and fruits also contain compounds which Plants, those nutraceuticals in the plants are just for plant food, which uh, is interesting is most people are actually the material we cut the pulp that you're using for. If you don't want to believe me, these scholars, uh, academics, don't easily take things. So if you don't foods of animal origin, uh, we are going to slaughter this animal in the gut. There is a, a great digester, but you know, it's not done yet, but within the gut there is uh, food that has been eaten by the animal and being processed. That actually has, that could be captured and utilized for things like animal feed, thing. Then blood uh, is uh, just left to flow and ends up in the environment, contaminating it. In countries, there's uh, blood is being used sausages, which that is actually available. Uh, so even for animals, we have substantial amount of uh, product ends up as waste. And uh, Approximately, if you think about filleting, uh, in filleting, uh, when you buy a fillet, about 50% of the fish is not part of that fillet. The rest stays, and these are skeletons and uh, skin. So, what can be done, or what are some of the options available for minimizing and exploiting? I have to emphasize. We don't want to create this waste so that we do the value addition to it. If we can minimize it, that would be better. But if you can't minimize it, then you try to get options for utilization. So uh, my students normally see this slide. We want to prevent or reduce waste. That's the, the first option. As you go down, the worst option is disposal. What I showed you at the beginning, that's what we don't want. And we want to try to play in between there. If we can't reduce, then uh, the next best option is human consumption. Uh, the other possibility is producing bioproducts. Bioproducts, uh, let's not confuse that with bio. Bio is just biological products. We can use it for animal feed, uh, industrial uses, uh, things, like, things like glue can be made from some of these materials. Energy, uh, we increasingly think about uh, biofuels, and we can also use it for agronomic purposes, fertilizers, to improve uh, fat soil fertility. And when it comes to utilizing, uh, we have not wasted, we have not gone into uh, the lower levels, uh, most of the utilizing of the compounds in these uh, can be done through these three options. I mentioned and uh, there are different techniques that are available for extraction, uh, including some that are aimed at have minimal negative impact. And we call them green technologies. 
The last and very interesting option with many possibilities is biotechnological transformation. And what is happening here is you're using pro biological processes like fermentation or enzyme technology to produce other materials that are valuable to uh, us. And uh, the key areas of application for the materials we generate from this bio waste include pharmaceuticals. And as you know, the pharmaceutical industry is one of those high end uh, as far as financial uh, rewards is concerned. So you can use them for pharmaceuticals. We can use them for environment like water purification and things like that. We can use them for cosmetics. Uh, a lot of those phytochemicals, apart from being good for NC non-communicable diseases, also good for your skin. So some of these guys are and used for uh, cosmetics. And as I mentioned before, food, we can extract these materials and use them for example, maize. When you look at maize as our raw material, we can have this diversity of products from maize. And most of them are not coming from the part we eat, they are coming from the bran. So we can exploit maize and make a large diversity of very valuable products. Even when you think about fish, uh, we can get fish protein, things like fish uh, enzymes. So there is really a lot that can be biomaterial. Uh, biotechnological processes uh, this is application of enzymes and microbes and we can do that to uh, get this diversity of uh, usable uh, very useful products like biofuel tempest food antibiotics so th there is really diversity of value you know, products valuable products that we can generate from the material that is currently being put to waste I now get to what I think would be the core of this. what have we contributed to this journey. And, um, my contribution, and while I say my, I mentioned before work with a lot of colleagues, but uh, this has a large footprint of what my, my own contribution uh, can be divided into these two main areas, uh, reduction, how do we reduce agri-food waste? And the second one is valuable product production, which we also call polarization. So um, we are looking at uh, how we make sure that we don't generate waste in the first place, but if the waste or the byproducts are there, how do we utilize the byproducts? And when it comes to reduction, two main objectives, one is uh, developing and promoting technologies, for service handling technologies, to avoid the spoilage from happening. And the second one is uh, really about the developing value-added products from those foods, and those value-added products are stable. So apart from, you know, if you have a mango, you can keep it as a mango, and you try to prolong its life. But you may also decide to make a product of mango which is value-added and stable. So that is as far as waste reduction is concerned. My main work has actually been on to the right, agri-food waste valorization. And here we've mainly been interested in characterizing the waste, developing protocols or methods for getting valuable products from this waste, and then evaluating the products that we make. I'll start from the area waste we get the way we, be, the way we handle food. So you possibly are reasonably familiar with uh, some of these uh, not very uh, good ways of handling food. Uh, so in a project we had some two uh, graduate students on this project. How do we it, it, it had a science and social science. We had one student in social science and one in food science. And determined about 
they see this is uh, made from this treatment and this is your made from the other treatment. They keep the data about the waste, the level of contamination, contamination. that was far more effective in making the farmers adopt the improved methods of handling food. And uh, this, uh, as I mentioned before, actually my belief is that we have a lot of good technologies as far as post-harvest handling is concerned, but what may be lacking is how do we actually convince the farmers and the other value chain actors to utilize these technologies. The second uh, example area of uh, waste reduction that I want to highlight, uh, we've, uh, with the colleagues, men in engineering, uh, worked on developing dryers which can be used by farmers and uh, you know, other people to give us good value products stable. Uh, this dryer uses hot water and it's called refractance window dryer. It's actually available. Some uh, SMEs are currently experimenting with it. That is a, a, a prototype which is in Cavanyoro. And this is a bigger prototype which is also in Cavanyoro. These dryers are very efficient, as I'll show you in uh, this, uh, this slide coming. So, as far as uh, preventing waste, that is one aspect. Give the farmers chain actors that can make the food to the table without getting spot in between. But sometimes that is not feasible. And what you need to do, we know, for example, in Uganda, most of our fruit is during one season. So even if you try to preserve it, it becomes a problem. So, I mean, you wanted to do good post service handling. So what we've done, uh, the other of our research is really about preservation. Create that stay longer. And you, hopefully all of us in this room, hopefully many online are familiar with this fruit. Uh, this fruit, we normally eat uh, that part. I'll talk a little bit about the parts we don't eat, but to begin with, I'm going to start with the parts we eat. These parts we eat also don't stay very long. So we wanted to do something to extend their uh, life. And uh, why, why are we interested in jackfruit? If you don't eat jackfruit, I hope you look at this slide and start eating jackfruit, because jackfruit has a number of uh, healthy benefits. So jackfruit is beneficial, eat it. Uh, it has, uh, I mentioned, NCDs, the non-communicable diseases, jackfruit helps us uh, to protect against some of these. So using uh, the refractance window dryer that I mentioned uh, before, we are able to dry jackfruit. And that pack you see is jackfruit powder. And this jackfruit powder, what we did, uh, this is a PhD student's work, we decided we wanted to get the best drying conditions so that the jackfruit powder is of good quality. And uh, uh, we were able to optimize the drying conditions. Uh, this graph shows some of the techniques we use for optimization so that it's not guesswork. You need the best conditions for drying. Uh, so we able to get the optimization drying conditions and able to characterize the dried product, but also use the dried product as an ingredient for some other foods. Uh, as far as the drying is concerned, it's, this is uh, our dryer. It's able to dry jackfruit in an hour. When you try to use solar dryers, the conventional ones, you need about three days. When you're using oven drying, which has been around for long and is expensive, you need about 18 hours. So this dryer is extremely effective in terms of speed, but not only speed, it's also a very good quality product that we get out of it. Uh, this is standard, it's called freeze drying, very expensive, you freeze the product and then if you remember the chemistry, you use sublimation to remove water. This is uh, the, like, it's normally used just for experiments to show you haven't deteriorated the food. And our dry has a uh, product, not as uh, white as this, but quite good. Uh, meanwhile, the oven dry is something worse. But uh, as the people of food science, we are often interested in what is the damage to the nutrients. 
And uh, without going into the real figures, this dryer gives you better ascorbic acid or vitamin C retention, beta carotene, which is the, the uh, vitamin A precursor retention, and those phytochemicals that I mentioned. It gives you very good retention of those nutrients. And when we use the flour we get from these dryers in making cookies, the cookies are far more acceptable than those without this material. We've used the same drying technique on passion fruits. I mentioned before that about 75% of passion fruit is actually thrown away. Uh, but even the amount that we are supposed to eat, we need to reserve it. So we've used it to create a uh, passion fruit. And I think I saw the student uh, who was leading this, who did this work as part of his master's. And uh, when you use that passion fruit powder as an ingredient for yogurt, the yogurt was also found to be highly acceptable. This technique, uh, we've tried it with other foods, including pineapple, including, uh, including uh, tomatoes. So that is an area of work which basically builds engineering aspect that I mentioned earlier. We've also had uh, some work done on pumpkin. Pumpkin is uh, uh, quite abundant, and uh, if you want to keep it long, it's important to think about preservation. And with the, this, we're able to optimize the, the conditions for uh, drying of pumpkins. Sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes are abundant. They also don't last very long. And we've been able to make uh, pasta, uh, nodules from uh, this pump. And these are also acceptable and uh, stable. Because if you're just keeping your sweet potato, sooner or later, you may have to trash it. Uh, other ways of preserving food, we've uh, utilized the extrusion cooking, extrusion technology, which is a very quick uh, heating process. Within very short time, uh, you get very high temperatures and preserve the food. We've applied this to a number of commodities, including sweet potatoes. We have one SME now, which is bl blending cereals with the vegetables and creating a stable product which is also nutritious. So that is really about reduction of waste by preserving or by developing and promoting appropriate post-harvest technologies. But I mentioned before that sometimes we get the byproduct and have to get create value out of it. So the second uh, part of my work has really been about creating valuable products from agri-food waste. And um, I'm worried that the house may not be very happy if I go away without showing some uh, chemical structures. So uh, if you're thinking about uh, jackfruit, a lot of the jackfruit is not eaten. It's thrown, we call it, we at best feed it to animals. And this part of the jackfruit is what we tried to utilize to make this uh, in that structure, which we call pectin. It's some carbohydrate, uh, we call it non, uh, non starch uh, polysaccharide. So, this pectin currently, we don't have anybody manufacturing it in you and food industries use it. I'll show you a little bit about the uses, but our aim was to utilize this product, the uh, waste from uh, jackfruit, after you moved the, we call them aerial bulbs that you've eaten. What do you rest? So a PhD student worked on this uh, pectin, and in order to appreciate why pectin, pectin has a lot of value. It is used in the pharmaceutical industry, it's used in the food industry, and it's also used uh, in packaging uh, to make coffee. So if you want the pectin, then uh, to think about the raw material, so jackfruit, using this simple process, we are able to produce uh, pectin with a yield of up to 30% from the inedible material. 
and the pectins that were produced from parts of uh, jackfruit happened to be a little different. They varied in their properties. And uh, again, I uh, should be happy that uh, when you look at the variation in mainly pectin, we are interested in the gelling. Can it form a good gel? Uh, also, uh, interested in the gelling speed. Does it gel fast enough? Apart from forming a strong gel, does it gel fast enough? We are able to understand why the gels made from the different pectins were varying in, in, in uh, properties by looking at the chemistry. I don't know whether members in this hall are familiar with this fruit. It's a tree fruit, uh, tamarind, and it's underutilized. Funny enough, for this tamarind, most of the fruit is edible. The seed is not edible. So we looked at the characterization of the fruit and realized that the seed has very, very high levels of phytochemicals. And again, phytochemicals are the good chemicals that we find in plants. So by uh, characterizing the seed and realizing that it was very high in phytochemicals, we also into food products and try to how does it affect food when the tamarind juice put uh, uh, tamarind uh, seed powder the levels of phytochemicals increment the for seed. Uh, and if you do the same with the levels of phytochemicals but the ability you could not add the beyond one point percent. So again, we could exploit to make sure we produce the more uh, healthy. We've also done some work with the leaves of cassava. Uh, in this cassava leaf. Leave them in the uh, question of the safety. So we've got a PhD student who is currently looking at banana. I mean, um, cassava leaves. And clearly, the leaves are high in protein. They are high in carbohydrates. They are high in uh, beta carotene, which I mentioned is the vitamin A in plants, and they are also high in these health-boosting chemicals, the phytochemicals. And through a process of uh, uh, blanching, blanching is some heat treatment, but mild, and uh, pounding, uh, uh, drying, able to get a safe and shelf stable food product. I thought about the plants, and like earlier on, animals are also important. So I'll very briefly talk about the studies we've done on. Afri uh, food waste. Most of the skin are made of collagen. A lot of health. And from collagen, make another called gelatin, which is not in uh, and uh, as in pharmaceutical applications. This is uh, what collagen looks like. Uh, this side just shows you the way collagen looks like uh, as far as the chemistry is concerned. Uh, but the value of collagen is about its gelling property. And the gelling properties of collagen is dependent on some amino acids that we call amino acids because of the way they look. Uh, I'll show you an example of the amino acid, but the, 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 the look of the amino acid has a ring, and we'll be seeing that shortly. Uh, this collagen, which we can process into gelatin, again, we don't have anybody producing it in Uganda. If you want to make it, you get it imported. And uh, we explored making it from Nile patch processing waste. And we are able to see that from Nile patch skins, and this was motivated by the many factors that we are 
producing fillet would give you up to 63% collagen. And the process is relatively simple. Uh, a bit of the characterization, we're able to see the collagen, what it looks like, and don't have to worry about that. I mentioned amino acids. These are the constituents of collagen that define uh, the gelling property. And we are able to show that compared to other fish species, null patch had a very good level of amino acids, 21.5 as compared to 17 percent in cod, which is the one widely used globally, and 30% uh, in uh, bovine. Bovine, um, generally mammals have higher uh, amino acid content. And uh, in order to get gelatin from collagen, you normally apply thermal processing, some uh, thermal uh, degradation. This is the process that uh, we utilized to make gelatin from collagen or from fish or skin. And through this process, you are able to get up to 64% yield gelatin from skins and 12% from bones. So the and the skin of null patch also can be a valuable uh, material for utilization. When you compare the skin and uh, collagen gelatins, the skin gelatin is basically superior. It has uh, better strength when you create a gel as to uh, the bone gelatin. We can also utilize Nile patch waste for making fish. Those of you who have tried supplements is one of those common supplements. Uh, it is uh, very healthy because it contains referred to as omega-3 fatty acids. Those are fatty acids with multiple uh, double bonds, but with the first double bond, position 3. That's why it's called omega-3. And uh, the benefits include uh, improving your cardiovascular health, uh, some protection at home, temperatures, and then separate. Use the belly flap area would by 74 percent yield. We are able to get up to 74 percent yield. And these belly flaps, again, like I mentioned, the filleting companies we are not we are not value for them. This oil, when we compared it to the commercial oils, which are uh, cod liver oil, we find that these oils have as much omega-3. So the, in, if, you know, locally, if we decided to use Nile patch, we are able to lock out the uh, omega-3 imports and utilize that for local uh, consumption. The oil is a bit unstable, so it would need stabilization if uh, produce it commercially. One of the concerns about fish oil normally is the contamination, the uh, heavy metals and, um, and, and uh, pesticide residues. And when we assess these oils, we notice that the levels of heavy metals, the levels of uh, pesticide residues, we are far below the recommended maximums, which means that this is uh, safe for utilization. We've also used, I mentioned that uh, you have a carcass, uh, when they fill it, they have, have the bone, but there is not some flesh left on the carcass. And that flesh, generally speaking, has been used for uh, people, I think they call it fish, sold locally, but you can also extract that uh, flesh and stabilize it and get protein rich food which uh, is usable very high protein up to 27 percent but also when we're thinking about protein one of the aspects we need to be concerned about is the quality of the protein this is highly digestible which means it is quality protein and uh, this work uh, is uh, is I think one of those uh, low-hanging activities that even uh, relatively with the relatively little capital one can translate into uh, products. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, I have run first uh, some of the work we've done, specifically the sector. I've done work which is not that doesn't fit in this presentation because I needed something focused. Uh, but what else can be done? in this area. I think there is still plenty that can be done. While I've touched a number of uh, agri-food waste materials, we have a lot of biodiversity and can deal with products from a lot more uh, agri-food materials than what I've, I've, I've spoken about. But it's not enough to keep doing that. I think technologies are efficacious, uh, what technologies can we use for things I think efficacy is high things like nanotechnology highly applied uh, technology as well as the economics of uh, everything we are doing. Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, as a professor, we are expected to do research. And uh, I do hope that I've provided some accountability for the research I've been doing. Uh, we are expected to do training. I do hope that I've uh, provided uh, some evidence that I've been training. And lastly, we are expected to do uh, technology translation, or technology transfer. And I feel, Vice Chancellor, that while I've done, as uh, uh, my principal did mention, while I've done a bit of uh, technology transfer, the incubator, and many things, I feel like during my remaining years, I want to put a lot more emphasis in this. And I do hope that I'll get the collaboration and the support to make this possible. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, 
Yes, thank you very much, Makere University Performing Arts and Film, and uh, the only college, College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Yes, today has been a very special day to the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, and may I humbly request all members of staff present from the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences to please stand and wave to Professor John H. Muyonga. Yes, thank you so much and uh, congratulations. Yes, online we have 186 participants. So we thank them for also actively following the proceedings. Permit me once again. And before I deliver the message of congratulation, allow me to say, colleagues, that this has been a very, very momentous afternoon for all of us uh, to appreciate the academia and the work that has been uh, done for some time by Professor Muyonga. And good enough, he has assured us that he's still with us and he's still God, 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 the good Lord. We pray to the good Lord that he keeps you around for a very, very long time. With that assurance, I'm sure the academia, Makerere, and the community will benefit a lot from you. Allow me to echo the message of the Vice Chancellor uh, that was reflected in his remarks that uh, indeed the professorial inaugural lectures are important representation of the academic nature of the, the individuals, but also the academic nature and value of the university. Because the demonstration that we have seen in Professor Muyonga's delivery uh, really showcase 
that we have in Makerere we have huge potential that we can utilize to impact the community. There is a lot of potential that we can uh, deliver to the community in translating the research that we do into products, into services, into training programs, into, into capacity building that can really, really add value uh, to the livelihoods and uplifting our communities. So he has also demonstrated uh, that uh, through this we are able to promote the national development agenda because his works blend harmoniously well with the national development plan and uh, I want to draw your attention to the emphasis on the principles of the circular economy that he has uh, well addressed and articulated which reflect the whole idea of the knowledge economy. And, uh, you know, where consumption and production are based on intellectual uh, capital, we can really reap a lot for the individuals, for the academy, but also for the wider society. Professor Muyonga has also demonstrated his contribution to the advancement of our institution's strategic goal to be a research-led university, which calls for the development of a framework uh, for packaging and marketing research outputs and uh, for appropriate adoption and adaptation by the various stakeholders, be it the business community, be it government, governmental agencies, uh, and also the local leadership that is looking uh, around uh, to impact and uplift the community. I also wish to uh, mention that Professor Muyonga's uh, delivery today has showcased the alignment of his research efforts with our uh, government's agenda that is enshrined in the NDP3 and the strategy that is to harness our abundant factors of production through knowledge-based economy of science, technology, and innovation. And in order to do this, the strategy involves deliberate effort towards agro-industrialization in order to increase commercialization and competitiveness of the agricultural production and uh, agro-processing. The universality of Professor Muyonga's research has demonstrated here uh, also demonstrate greater efforts to the current global issues that are, are reflected in the sustainable development uh, goal number two, which is to address hunger, okay, zero uh, uh, hunger, which is aimed at wasting less food and supporting local farmers, as well as the SGD 12, okay, which uh, deals with responsible consumption and production. Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is estimated that, uh, as again highlighted, that 13.3% uh, of the world's food is lost delivered. Professor Muyonga. Muyonga, congratulations. Comment that uh, faculty, all of us who are here, sorry, your lecture, so that we make this much more regular. My office has committed to and my has done yes we should be on the eight in a year health people are that yeah the hand of is well in academic registrar that has uh, showing enthusiasm to, to witness and give support. I want our colleagues from other faculty who have attended the uh, seven of them who are here, Principal Kovab, most uh, grateful to uh, Principal uh, with support uh, and corners. Uh, yeah, this end. Vice Chancellor Muyonga.
it's uh, kind to all may i request the principals and deputy principals in the room to join the photo and then now what i'm going to request uh, the members of the family members of the family yes to request the members of the family to return to their seats. Then let us have Professor Myonga remain with, um, yes. So the principal and deputy principal. No, we need the photo balance. Let us occupy these chairs. Yes. And you're smiling on behalf to participate with me the vice I'm happy I've seen Professor Sarah Sally okay Professor Sarah Sally is a member of Makere University Council thank you so much for attending in the same We take this opportunity to thank the Institute of Open Distance and Life Learning. I'm glad that Professor Paul Muyinda is in the room. The Institute of Open and Distance and Life, La Life Learning has been handling the live streaming for this occasion. For this occasion. Kayes Communication Office, Hasfa, Mariam, and Albert. Thank you so much. Makere Public Relations Office. Media team, stream and digital media, Office of the Academic Registrar, Office of the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic Affairs, Doreen Dickens Joyce. We are coming to the end. Yes. Four anthems. We are going to be led by Makere University, Department of Performing Arts and Film. It has been a special. It has been a special day here at Makere University. We are gathered here at Makere University Yusuf Lule Central Teaching Facility Auditorium. We've witnessed Professor. Uh, his professorial inaugural lecture and we are optimistic that in the next we will also experience other professors deliver their professorial inaugural class. We all rise for the anthems.
Thank you very much.